Welcome to the episode about magic. So to make it easier on the player and on the GM, the magic system here starts up pretty simple. So you have your spells. Each spell has some default values that you can modify with some upgrades or like customization. So let's talk about casts first. There are no spell slots here. So each spell has its own slots, has its own uh, value. That means how many times you can cast that spell, and that is one. Then you have the magic skill. Um, it is not really necessary if you're not going to use wild, unstable or infernal magic, or taking, for example, a core ability that will modify your game in a way, needing you to have a magic skill. I like to rule it that you can be like an advanced caster without having the magic skill, but I didn't find like any restriction that necessarily says that you can, that you need to have the magic skill to be able to cast. Let's go to the next one. So each spell requires somatics. You can certainly modify a spell so it doesn't require you to move your little hands, but you need to move your little hands in order to cast. The thing that makes our life much easier is the standardized duration, which is one of these six phases. What are phases? Stay tuned. In the combat video, we will go through phases. And the effect, like how much it affects something. So if it is Damage, for example, it will be 1d6 damage as a default value. Also, in terms of your range, you have standardized range. Each non-modified spell uses a touch attack range, so you need to touch someone to cast a spell. And of course, uh, taking all this into account, the target, you can only have one target affected by your cast, unless modified. I'm really thankful that we have this simple guideline that answers the questions about all the spells. So if your player doesn't customize the spell and they ask, what is my duration? It is always 1d6. You just reference this to them again. This is the list of the basic spells. I will probably also include it in, in the video. Right, so. So in terms of customizing spells, you start from this list and then you add benefits and limits like you have already seen with equipment, with uh, your character, with everything. If you take a benefit, you spend three points. If you take a limitation, you gain three points. Uh, and this is maybe the easiest way to get into the, the customization and the building of the spells. But that is not all. You can build your own spells. How do you do that? Well, you start with a name. I have a name, you have a name, so why shouldn't the spell have a name? And also make it something that kind of explains what it does, it makes it easier, then you take a basic spell from the book or you take one of the basic effects, the thing that you would add on to a basic spell where you can add that as a, like a basic effect and then upgrade it. Also, then on top of that, add effects, add limitations and you're done, you have your spell. I wouldn't recommend you do this if you're just starting out. You should be familiar with the book, with the rules, with the spells, and then you can start really exploring what the point by spell customization and building system has to offer. And also you need to be safe. You need a safe space. Uh, when you're there for one day, you can build a custom spell. Right, so when you're taking the limitations, the two limitations that will stick out to you are the unstable and infernal spells. And for those, you have to roll your magic skill. And why is that? Because if it fails, you have these tables that can do some interesting, unpredictable or annoying and destructive things, which are something that your fighters that just want to boink will surely enjoy when you do in a confounded space. Okay, now let's ask a question. Narratively speaking, where do you get the spells? Where all the magic is at? Well, Crown and Skull gives you at least like some guidelines on that. They say, well, if you want to learn some very costly spell, maybe you find an Elder Wizard, maybe you stumble onto his magic tower and he helps you with crafting that spell, he teaches you how to craft the spell. Narratively, that could be very satisfying. Or you just find gems. Some spells live in gems. Some souls live in gems, but these gems, these ones that I have, these are not soul gems. These are soul gems, trust me. There is also the idea that magic lives in the nature, and if you spend enough time uh, snooping around the nature, you will find spells hidden in the trees, in the land. You will feel the magic essence and the ley lines flowing through everything that is alive. So, um, that might be a hint that you're going down a druid path, maybe? There is no druid path in the book as of now, but there are some ad additions. I think one of the hex uh, releases on Patreon, on Runehammer Patreon, actually has a druid progression. 
But this is so homebrew, like you can mix and match things, create a druid without really like calling it a druid. That's that's the, the whole point. So speaking of paths, if you want to be mainly a spellcaster, for example, well, you have three types of spellcasters here. Uh, it is more like uh, just systematically like grouping the rules I've mentioned so far to help you like create a scope around what you're actually going to use. So sorcerers, as you can see here, basically you're using the basic spells and just modifying them a bit. The, for the mage, you're wielding the, the custom spells. You're now comfortable with doing them. For the wizard, that's where uh, it gets even deeper. You have three progression paths and they unlock when you earn your first three or more hero points. At that point, your wizard suddenly realizes, well, I am uh, one of these star fallen, falling from the stars. Well, that, yeah, that's, that's how wizards are formed. The ancient one, of course, I don't need to mention that you have to be old to be an ancient one and the demonologist, basically, yeah, the necromancer uh, type of thing. But as I said, they there are additions, you can mix and match things, you can create your own, so this is not the limit. Don't let anyone else limit you, only the sky can limit you. And what if you're like, nah, I don't like this uh, magical arcane stuff, give me the, the fate, I have faith into the divine, I want the divine to have faith in me. Well, you can use your fate skill instead of the magic skill. After you have put three or more hero points into the fate skill, you can kind of choose your patreon. Um, there is not really like a, a list of gods that you can choose, each culture has their own gods, their interpretations, all that, so you would roll your fate skill for casting the spell. Each time you cast a spell um, with your fate skill, your fate skill goes up. You believe in your god, you have more fate. This bonus goes from plus one to 14 and as soon as you fail the fate skill roll, you lose the bonus. You still have your ranks that you've put into the skill, you just lose the, the bonus, right? And if you fail your roll, you cannot cast the spell. Of course, where is uh, your faith divine caster type of character without a divine focus here called the holy symbol? It can basically be good or bad like people, but is it really good or bad? Is anyone really good or bad? That is a philosophical question you ask this thing here because I didn't want to draw anything that could trigger people. Unless this is a symbol in some like cultural religion, which I hope it isn't. <laughs> And of course there is prayer and it's used more narratively here. You need 1d4 rounds to pray and then you can earn your paycheck. Well, a miracle. And how does the miracle function? There is no really guidelines for that. Uh, basically you pitch to your DM, pretty please DM, God, Patreon, whoever is listening. I am in deep shit, can you please help me in some way? Of course. Anytime you narratively describe it in a satisfying way, your DM will be more inclined to help you and, and make it happen. Right, another concept that I want to talk about is wild magic. You as a crown and skull veteran, someone who knows the spells by heart, knows the effects, the limitations, everything you need to cast a spell, you can basically compile any description into crown and skull spell point systems. You see spells everywhere, everything is a spell. Basically, you make a spell uh, on the fly and, and kind of tie it to the effects and limitations from the rules, then you roll your magic skill and your penalty is actually your spell value. So your roll must be less than magic minus spell value. What is the spell value? Well, when you add all the points and decrease uh, all the points from limitations, what is left, that is your spell value. So your magic skill minus that spell value roll to cast. And if you are lucky, and this is my lucky die. Oh wow, I failed. Critical failure. So you would roll on the table for unstable spells to see what happens. This can be really fun, but like reserve it for playing with people that either have enough patience to wait for you to craft a spell on the fly, do it in like specific situations where you really need it, or if you're already experienced enough to not hinder the game just for your own fun. Anti-magic and the anti-magic functions here mostly as skills. You have this list of skills that you can use and they unlock after you have reached like your first 15 plus points. And of course, if you have all these abilities, you are not going to just be satisfied with uh, like a couple of spells. You will want to overspend. You will want to like conjure the, the forces of nature, of evil, of good, make a deal with an entity or a god and get a tattoo that is scribed in my flesh and give me more power. 
and you will get more points which you can spend uh there is a story aspect to this of course there is like people looking down on you because you have those tattoos i won't go into the details of how you get this here because yeah this is just the basics i think i've covered a bit more than basics here but yeah that is everything you need to know about the path of magic minus scribing stuff into your your flesh that would be it i hope this is helpful i hope this wasn't too long um in the next video we will go and see how combat works trust me the magic system is the deepest thing here and since we're not going into the lore we're almost done so yeah uh we are left with combat progression all that stuff thank you so much for watching and as always no outro just farewell